Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Music Theory with Gil. This installment will be part two of the analysis for Chrono Trigger's main theme, and if you haven't checked out part one, I strongly encourage you to do so because we're going to be building upon what we've already discussed in part one. And as always, check the description below for any links and timestamps. In this episode, we're going to be discussing the use of suspensions and how the Sus4 triad is used to effectively create cohesion between chords and help generate the overall atmosphere found within this theme. I personally find the Sus4 triad to be a huge part of this theme, but before I show you just how important it is, let's talk about what a suspension is. I'm not going to go into the deep history of suspensions, and there are multiple ways to define a suspension, but what I am referring to specifically is the sus4 triad. What this chord name is stating is that the triad is built with the fourth rather than the third, as in it contains a root, perfect fourth, and a perfect fifth. You've heard this chord in many situations before, even if you're unaware of it. And that's because it's an extremely effective way to create tension and resolution within a chord. One of the reasons it's so effective is because it doesn't fall into either of the two traditional categories, major or minor. A couple of examples of this would include suspending on the 5 chord, resolving, and then cadencing to 1. Another example would be to hit the 5 chord, suspend on the 1, and then resolve for the full 1 chord. The problem is that we won't actually be talking about suspensions and resolutions in this. Instead, we're going to be looking at how Mitsuda uses suspended triads on top of other chords to create a cohesion between chords and also to generate an overall mood. And the mood of that is ambiguity. And that's why I don't want to delve into the full depth of what a suspension is. All I want you to know is that a suspended triad has the potential to create ambiguity within the sonic texture. And what I mean is that if I play a sus4 chord, you're most likely just going to have to guess as to what it's going to resolve to. And that's especially so if there's no context for you to hear the sus4 chord within. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and play a few rounds of Guess That Resolution. Round 1. Ah, a pleasant resolution to a major chord. Okay, let's try round 2. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you guessed I was going to show you an example of a minor chord. Okay, well let's try round three. Okay, that was a trick setup because I didn't resolve to either a major or a minor chord that felt like home. Instead, I actually resolved to a dominant chord that was a separate chord entirely and then resolved that one to home. So again, this ambiguity within the sound allows us to push the colors around quite a bit within our harmonic structure. And you can use the suspended triad in more ways than only as a standalone suspended triad. And what I mean is that you can create melodic ideas derived from the suspended triad that will create a certain atmosphere within that melodic line. Additionally, we can also use sus4 triads as upper structures, which is what we're going to be looking at today. And what an upper structure does is we're placing a triad on top of another chord that will give it a new dimension to the overall chord sound. Before we start analyzing the upper structures in this piece, let's go ahead and see just how important the sus4 triad is within the entire composition. We're currently looking at the entire melody of the theme. With the color blue, let's go ahead and fill in all of the instances of the E sus4 within the melody. This is clearly a large chunk of the melody that is a straight up arpeggiation of the suspended triad. Right from the intro, you see a suspended triad spanning two octaves across four measures. This same melodic contour is then later used with a different rhythm and is used all throughout the theme. And the variety of ways that we're seeing Mitsuda use this line means it isn't just popping up in one instance. And the amount that it occurs got me wondering, well, how often do the notes individually show up? Well, let's take a look at that. So first, let's take a look at the root, E. Now, the fourth, A. And lastly, we'll take a look at B, the fifth. So yeah, you can pretty much see that this entire chart is nearly colored. Now, of course, there are more things to consider than just, hey, I bet he was thinking of an E sus4 this whole time. And what I mean is that this melody primarily pulls from E minor, so it's not a big surprise to see these notes pop up. At the same time, though, Mitsuda could have easily chosen loads of other notes, especially considering how often he is using non-diatonic chords. But instead, notes from the E sus4 triad continue to pop up. And rather than merely look at them, we're going to actually go ahead and start analyzing these instances where the sus4 is heavily implemented. 
A great place to start looking is at the introduction. We have the two chords A minor and F sharp minor, which present a rather interesting sound when in succession to one another. And before we see how Mitsuda colors these chords, let's go ahead and hear them in their native state as triads. So you might be hearing that there's a darker, more serious tone to these two chords, and that's because we have two minor thirds distanced a minor third away from one another. And if we do a fusion of the two sounds, we get a diminished chord, which sounds like this. However, we don't have this sound because we have perfect fifths on each chord. And while it is a dark sound, it isn't unstable. But as we'll see with many chords, Mitsuda hardly ever uses only the triads. Instead, we'll see within the strings, we often have a seventh of the chord. And that's the case for both the A minor and the F sharp minor, which turns the sound into this. And since we're implementing the sevenths, we start to hear a softer sound as opposed to just the triads. And when we start to look at the melody where the E sus4 is implemented, we start off with a B on top of the chord, which is the ninth of the A minor. We then hear the rest of the E sus4 played in the following measure, which in the context of an A minor chord yields E as the fifth and the A as the root. When the F sharp minor hits, we hear the exact same melodic idea only an octave higher, and now we're gonna hear the B as an 11th on top of the chord, with the E being a minor seventh and the A being the minor third. So the E sus4 not only brings out an extension on each of the chords, it additionally reinforces the two other common tones, E and A, making for three in total. The sound is further smoothened by the melody remaining structurally consistent across both of the chords. But even if we implemented the E sus4 as only a voicing and didn't construct a melodic line with the information, the two chords would still be softened and more cohesive because of the common tones and that use of the same upper structure. So to recap, we have two non-diatonic chords that, as triads, only yield a single common tone. Additionally, they produce a seemingly dark sound. When each chord becomes a seventh chord, we have two common tones, and we're starting to blend the two sounds as they soften up a little bit. When the sus4 is implemented, we get the extensions that really round off the overall sound of each chord, and we now have three common tones between the two chords. This can lead to the two chords becoming almost like a gradient with one another and can easily push back and forth, which is what occurs in the A section when we have A minor to F sharp minor repeated twice. Next up, I want to jump on over to the B section so we can talk about another instance of how a sus4 triad is being put to good use. Unlike before, we won't be using an E sus4 triad. Instead, we'll be using a B sus4 and we'll be seeing how it's implemented across G major and A major, which are the opening chords for the B section. And before we get into it, I wanna briefly mention how cool it is that Mitsuda uses this in the B section, because in part one, we discussed very briefly how the B section is so different than the A section. We have an orchestration change, we have a lot of rhythmic change, the overall mood is just different. And even though it's a different sus4 triad, it's still a sus4 sound, which helps tie the two sections together while keeping them separate and fresh. Alright, so the relationship between these two chords isn't as much of a stretch as we found between A minor and F sharp minor. Instead, they both stem from the same key center, which is D, the key center for pretty much the entirety of the B section. But it's always important to remember that great music isn't only comprised of complexities. It often consists of utilizing simplicities, because remember, creativity is the goal, not complexity for the sake of complexity. So let's look into one of the ways Mitsuda manages to elevate this seemingly simple chord progression to being a creative example of music. And like before, let's check them out as triads. So as stated before, not a huge stretch on the ears, we're just moving two major chords up by a whole step. When we investigate the voicing of the G major triad, we actually see another triad is implemented, this being D major voiced in second inversion, or A, D, and F sharp. The extensions given by the triad are the 9th, 5th, and 7th of the chord respectively. And then if we consider the B found in the melody, we now have our 3rd of the chord, giving us overall a G major 9 chord. The A major is voiced with its own triad, A major. This of course yields only the root, 3rd, and 5th. The inclusion of the melody gives us the extension of a 6th on top of the A major. And while Mitsuda could have followed suit and built a triad off the 5th just like he did with a G major, this would have resulted in a dominant voicing, which is the tension Mitsuda has avoided the entire theme so as not to generate any strong cadences. And as a result, we now have these voicings. 
we're already getting a chord progression that is pretty cohesive, but the inclusion of the B sus4 will further meld the two chords. On the G major chord, the B sus4 is reinforcing the B and F sharp, and is also giving the additional note E, which is the 6th or 13th of the chord. On the A major, the B sus4 is reinforcing the E and F sharp already heard, but is giving the addition of B, the 9th, and as a result, we now have these voicings. So with all of these notes being put to use, we now have four common tones between the two chords. And aside from the seventh being included in the G major, we have two chords with the same extensions, those being the ninth and the thirteenth in addition to the major triads. For me at this point, I start to hear this as washes of sound being blended together, sort of like a paintbrush pushing colors into one another, rather than being blocked out separately. And this being very similar to when I mentioned a gradient occurring between A minor 9 and F sharp minor 11 because of all the common tones between those two chords. And with this imagery in mind, let's go ahead and listen to the first four measures of the B section. So to recap, we now have two diatonic triads that, despite already being connected, have been given greater cohesion by the use of common tones by extensions and also implementing the BSS4 as an ostinato across the two chords. This can make it almost sound as though you're gliding between the two sounds rather than blocking them out individually. And while there are certainly more chords that we can discuss in the B section, I feel you have the tools to analyze what's left. But should you need any assistance, definitely reach out to me on Patreon and I'll help out. All right, now let's move on to the C section. Again, this is one of my favorite sections and there's so much to talk about, but we're gonna stay on course and talk mostly about the implementation of the sus4 triad. However, rather than breaking down how these chords are connected, we're going to discuss some other things instead. My reasoning for this is because C major and D major share the same relationship as G major and A major, that being that they're only a whole step apart and they're both major triads. Additionally, they've been voiced similarly, and the sus4 triad has the same relationship to these two chords as did B sus4 with G major and A major. Instead, we're gonna talk about how the sus4 used within this section is similar but also different from the one found in the B section section. And then lastly, we'll break away from the sus4 and talk a little bit about what Mitsuda is doing inside the voicings of the strings. Alright, so how is the ostinato similar and different? One thing we can immediately notice about the E sus4's implementation is that it is literally unchanged the entire time that we hear it in the C section. Additionally, the B sus4 pattern lasted an entire measure before the idea could be repeated, whereas we now have a pattern that has been compressed to the length of only half a measure. But what I find most intriguing is how the melodic contour compares. Before we started at the root and worked our way upward, and now we're starting at the fifth and working downward. And as the C section explodes with all this energy, the ostinato also leaps upward to assist. And since we're starting at B, the fifth of the E sus4, we can hear an octave's difference between the two starting notes of each ostinato. This upward leap also creates an instance of contrary motion, which is a very strong motion in music. This most noticeably occurs between the ostinato and the bass guitar. As the bass guitar leaps downward from F sharp to C, the ostinato leaps upward. Furthermore, and this is probably my favorite thing about these two ostinatos, is that we can actually extract this exact melodic shape of the E sus4 ostinato from within the B sus4 ostinato. The only difference is that the idea has been transposed to E sus4 rather than being B sus4. Now this could totally be a coincidence, but even if it is, that doesn't negate the consistency between the two ideas. Furthermore, if you study the works of other composers, you'll find many instances like this, where information has been reused in a new way to garner fresh ideas while remaining consistent to the overall development and sound of a piece. Basically, you're squeezing everything you can get out of the notes that you're writing. And that's why we discuss techniques such as inverting and retrograding music, which have both been used extensively by some of history's greatest composers. So again, coincidence or not, great compositions often rely on the quality of ideas versus the quantity. And speaking of quality ideas, I want to break away from talking about the sus4 triad for a moment and talk about something Mitsuda does within the strings on the C section. It's another instance of subtlety, but it certainly makes an impact into the overall sound. Now the strings don't have much movement in the voices, instead they mostly focus on providing a lot of rhythmic intrigue. However, in the second measure of each D6-9, we get additional rhythms as well as movement in the voices. Initially, the voicing is A, F-sharp, and D, but on beat 4 of the second measure, the F-sharp slips up to G. While we could talk about how this is another example of suspension being used, I want to instead talk about what happens after, which is G leaping down to E when C major returns. 
Mitsuda does something similar when we return to the second set of measures on the D69, except this time, rather than moving upward, the voices create a contrary movement and proceed downward, with F sharp moving to D. And what's excellent about this choice in voicing is that right after that downward movement, we leap upward, except this time, it's a quite large leap. Now, if you can imagine the first time you heard this theme, you would probably have been okay with hearing us return to C major. And that would sound like this. But instead, we got this. And this is a brilliant rush of excitement. The strings leaped much higher than we would have anticipated, and this along with Mitsuda giving us a suspension in the E minor 11 chord really drives home that propulsion to leap into the game and get to playing. And with an opening theme, I feel that's a completely appropriate goal to have in mind for your listeners, since you certainly don't want a gamer questioning whether or not they really want to press that start game. So in the C section, we find that Mitsuda continues to use the sus4 triad as an ostinato, but this time he manages to create a fresh idea by extracting only a segment of the former ostinato to create this new one. Additionally, Mitsuda's use of small and simple movements in the strings set up interesting transitions between the chords, but also assisted in deceptively creating excitement in the final measure. This concludes all I have to say in part 2 of my analysis for Chrono Trigger's main theme. I know that I had mentioned a couple of other things worth analyzing in the theme and there's certainly so much more to talk about, but for now I plan to move on to another theme. But until next time, look out for more transcriptions and please comment, like, and subscribe to my channel so you can stay up to date. Otherwise, thanks for watching another episode of Music Theory with Gim.